Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation with Tom Merritt and Leo Laporte. Episode 30, recorded November 2nd, 2011. Eric Reese. Triangulation is brought to you by Ford, featuring voice activated Sync App Link. Now you can control select smartphone apps with your voice, so you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Check it out in the 2012 Ford Fiesta and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, visit Netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Triangulation, the show in which Tom Merritt and I pick somebody who's really smart and try to learn a thing or two. Right? Yes. <laughs> they do their best. <laughs> Every once in a while we learn Occasionally something. we learn. I it hope you all at home. through our hard heads. This is uh, actually a book that uh, I've been wanting to read for some time because I feel that I am fumbling badly <laughs> with the startup that I am running. It's called The Lean Startup. And it's actually really made waves in Silicon Valley. Everybody's reading it and talking about it. Eric Reese is here. Am I saying that right? Reese? Yeah, yeah. I like the candy. Yeah, I like the Reese's. Reese like the candy. Reese pieces. <laughs> he is. Uh, he's actually started uh, three different uh, startups. You might know IMVU. Mm -hmm. What happened to IMVU? Did you sell it? It's actually still going. It is a private and profitable company. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. CTO and founder. Uh, you currently entrepreneur in residence at Harvard Business School. That's good. Thank and uh, and uh, so did you? Re how did you do this book? Was it a lot of research, or did you write just like write what you know? Like here's how I screwed up. Well, don't that, you do that? <laughs> it's helpful to have screwed up a bunch of times because that gives you a lot of material to write about. But I actually enjoyed doing the research for it also. Because a lot of case studies in here. Yeah, wanted to really show people the ideas in action. Yeah. And since you know I've been talking about these ideas for a couple of years now, there now are enough practitioners out there who have tried things and had themselves had some opportunities to fail and succeed and to tell those stories too. Just to kind of show the diversity of like what entrepreneurship looks like today so what, and the different kinds of entrepreneurs that are putting these ideas to work. What's the principal idea behind a lean startup? The word lean comes from lean manufacturing, things like the Toyota production system that happened in Japan. And what I wanted to do is see if we could take some of those ideas that have been really effective in established companies and adapt them to the process of entrepreneurship because I really felt that the way I was taught to do entrepreneurship and new product development was totally haphazard, uh, didn't work very well, right. uh, it was really sloppy, and so and kept putting me in a situation where I would build amazing technology, build a great product, and then nobody would use it. So I was like, well, I guess I'm satisfied that I got to build something, that was fun, but the whole point of building a new product is because you want people to engage with it, you want it to be successful, you want it to make money, whatever your goal is, you want to change the world. I mean, there's nothing new about starting businesses. Uh, we, we kind of exalt this whole idea of the entrepreneur, <laughs> but people have been starting businesses since people have had businesses. Uh, uh, what is different about modern entrepreneurship, and I presume pr pr particularly tech entrepreneurship? Oh, yeah. It's, it's really a democratization of access to entrepreneurship. It used to be that if you wanted to become an entrepreneur, you had to, have capital. You had to own the means of production, yeah. good old Karl yeah. Marx. Mm -hmm. Well, we yeah. live in a time where you can rent the means of production. <laughs> How cool is that? Yeah. So if you want to start building a new business, it doesn't matter if it's in tech, in media, in fashion, and retail. Uh, almost all of those businesses, you can start something relatively inexpensively and more importantly, very quickly. So you don't have to first go build the factory, then design the thing. No, it's like first, you know, do the Kickstarter campaign to find out right. if customers want it. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, deliver your first prototypes based on rented factory time, you know, uh, on a, you know, just in time fab, some kind that automatically produces the device. And then, at that point, when you know that you have customers for sure, you know how much they're willing to pay, you know how much it costs to build a device, then you can think about, uh, well, how do I use those facts to build a scalable business? You're a tenant entrepreneur. Yeah. You just, you just rent your space and, and go with the idea. Boy, but and that the, has changed everything because, I mean, you know, next, we have a restaurant next door that just went yeah. out of business. In the old days of starting a business, you're really throwing something up against the wall and hoping it sticks. You said, well, it looks like a good place to start a restaurant. Uh, I think I've got a good <laughs> menu. I'll put a million dollars literally into this and cross my fingers. Yeah. So we're in a very different time where thousands of dollars is enough. Mm -hmm. um, and 
there are opportunities in so many areas, but it's particularly software is where you're seeing an amazing web and software. For right? sure. I mean, that's, and that's my background. So right. to, uh, I think that is, you know. I mean, I, if you wanted to start a new computer company, there's some capitalization you got to have. But oh, if you, you want to make start, semiconductors, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. yeah. but if you want to start a, 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 a web site or a software service, it doesn't cost much at all. You use, you know, you can use EC3 and, uh, and you know, you don't even have to own your computers. Oh no, you you wouldn't want to. You right? wouldn't all, want to. All of your physical assets are actually liabilities, right? Because they get in the way of you being able to act with agility, which one of the key concepts from lean startup is being able to pivot when you realize you've made a mistake or where some part of your business plan is invalidated. Instead of treating that like, oh my God, it's a crisis. I can't believe I made a mistake. I got something wrong. We accept that as entrepreneurs, you will. You're going to get things wrong. It's going to yeah. be. You're going to make mistakes. Your core. You know, business assumptions, some of them are going to be wrong. And that's not the end of the world. That doesn't have to be the end of your company unless you've, you know, built out all the web van <laughs> distribution centers yeah. and you've gone to the press and you've launched, <laughs> you've burned all your money. And on, you've you know, sponsored all the cup holders and, at Pac Bell Park. Yeah, exactly. Right. If, you, if you've, you know, if you put all that momentum behind something that is just a bunch of guesses, then, you know, you better hope the rocket ship lands in a good place. Otherwise, you're, you're in, you know, you can miss the moon by quite a lot. So it really does parallel how software development nowadays works. It's iterative. With Ruby on Rails, you get something running and then you say how's that work and you iterate and you iterate so you're saying startups today are iterative processes mm -hmm. you got it exactly right we actually advocate something called continuous deployment in the lean startup model which is a specific mode of software development where we put software into production continuously as soon as it's written so if you go to InView right now and you sat down and said hey I got an idea for a feature let's code it up boom 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 code it on, the, on, on, on my desk we'd say all right 20 minutes later it's live in production. Wow. And we can do that without taking the site down, introducing bugs, causing a lot of problems, because there's a whole methodology to right. preventing mistakes. It's, very, it's akin to the old Toyota production system. Remember that famous and on cord? You know, a worker pulls a cord, if they see even the smallest defect, the whole line stops right. and you address it. So we have that equivalent facility in our production process so that if somebody makes a mistake, if a developer tries to break something, um, instead of automatically inflicting that on customers, our system can detect that we made a mistake, automatically revert it, shut down the line, figure out what went wrong, and fix it. That sounds like a... Really? Yeah. Sounds like a pipe dream. We really have that? We really have that. No, it, it, it's totally real. It really works? Yeah, we really do that. I, listen, and when I is first... Is it Rails? What people, is it? it what, what uh, well, it, InView is from 2004, so so our infrastructure is really... It's archaic by modern standards. It's PHP? It's PHP and a little bit of Java, a little bit of C, a little no bit framework. of Python. I mean, it wasn't... There wasn't an overarching framework, but right. we were able to build up all this infrastructure piece by piece, incremental investment for incremental return, because we were following this process that always said, let's always be maximizing how fast we can learn new things. Mm, so I like that. the infrastructure of something like continuous deployment, it's not really rocket science. Most engineers I sit down, if I can get them past, well, that'll never work. So they'll just pretend hypothetically that it would work. How would you build it? Most mm -hmm. people know how to do it. But most people can't understand why. What's wrong with just launching once a week, once a month, you know, once a quarter? Remember in the old days when the year the product came out was in the name of the product? Right. Like Windows, Windows 98. 95, right? Yeah. <laughs> like that's the year. So that tells you something about the speed at which software used to be delivered right. at most once a year. Else you'd, you know, well, it's still it that way uh, for things like Windows, but Windows, not for yeah. web software. But not you, for you web talk software. a lot about not for any product. focusing right. the features, too, and keeping the features limited. So you're not throwing everything in there. That seems to feed off of this idea of being able to release faster, exactly right? Because right. you're not doing too much. And, and therefore, your opportunities to be wrong are minimized. Mm -hmm. We call it the minimum viable product, or MVP. And, and part of the, one of the biggest sources of waste in my life, in all entrepreneurs' life, is the time you spend arguing with your co-founders about what features <laughs> absolutely have to be in version <laughs> one, and what could you live without, what bugs do you absolutely have to fix. I mean, it just, we'll talk about an endless and unwinnable argument. Right. Minimum viable product says, no, there's actually a clear standard for what should be in the, in the version one. It should be the absolute minimum necessary to learn whatever we want to learn with this experiment. And so we're, we're reconceiving product development as a set of scientific experiments that are designed to help us learn something important. So Agile is about being able to fail and recover from the failure, mm -hmm. and l more importantly, learn from that failure exactly. so you can iterate and do the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, slowly moving closer and closer to the perfect product. Mm -hmm. But it's Zeno's paradox, you never get there. You never get there. Yeah. Well, and what happens is, one of the one of the misconceptions when people get the religion about this, it's all about iteration and data, and you know that's all good stuff. Right. But people sometimes are like, "But wait a minute, isn't vision really important for entrepreneurship? Aren't we supposed yeah. to?" Yeah. You know, don't I, don't I have to walk in the door want. with a brilliant vision? Steve Jobs didn't ask his customers. Yeah, right, and, and Henry Ford didn't ask his customers. Like, and, and yeah. there is a kernel of truth to that idea that customers don't know what they want. Because they don't. Dropbox, you use as an example yeah, exactly. in this book. They couldn't. They were all engineers. They couldn't explain to somebody <laughs> what Dropbox was. 
to save their life. Yeah. You had to use it. Exactly right. So and how it, do they solve that? Well, so the Dropbox MVP is so cool. It's so simple. I tell these engineers all the time, and they're like, no, that's too simple to work. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> no, too simple is good. It couldn't work. Here's what they did. They, before they had finished building their product, you know, that Dropbox took about two years to build. It was a very complicated product. Yeah. The integration is amazing, so it was hard Huge. to build. So yeah. before they had finished that process, they created a video. And it's just this video. You can, it's still on the internet. Uh, you can find it. They posted it to Dig, and it was just Drew narrating him using the product. And Even screen, though there was no there's product. There's no product. Doesn't, the things that he's showing like sort of kind of work in the lab a little bit, but I mean, it's not real yet, but it looks very polished. You can see the kind of magic thing. And in fact, if you look carefully, all the files he's dragging around, they're all like dig in jokes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's all like funny. It's all funny stuff. Brilliant, uh, by the way. That's correct. smart. Yeah. Yep. It was a way know for him audience. to go to those spe a specific early adopter audience yep. and say, I know, I feel you guys' pain, and let me show you a world, you know, the way I see it. And he invited people from based on the video to sign up basically to pre order the early version of Dropbox. And I've, they got, I, you know, 10,000. I fell for it. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, it was, you know, <laughs> seemed real. And the great thing about early adopters is they don't mind right. being first to try right. a new incomplete product. Yeah, they it's love important. that. So part of this culture is that you have a culture, an audience, a potential marketplace that's willing to put up with this crappy <laughs> stuff you're yeah, yeah. shipping because they know that they're helping iterate Along exactly with right. you, exactly their right. partners with you. That's the great thing you. about early adopters is they actually prefer the 80% solution because right. it means they're getting it first. It's not the same, you know, it's not ready for prime time. It's not the 100% thing that their, their grandma can use. Google right. really realized right. that. Beta. Yeah. Beta, 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 beta. They abused it. You know, I think there's a lot of people who, yeah, <laughs> yeah they that, still, they do. We'll there's a that, lot yeah. of people probably now reading the Steve Jobs book saying, aha, this is how you, you're an entrepreneur. You have a clear, driving vision. You ignore what everybody else tells you. You well, don't listen to your audience. You keep it a complete uh -huh, uh -huh. secret till it is a fully formed project, and then you reveal it to the world magically. And we're going to have 100 companies fail because they're trying to do this. Do you think this. that's what Apple actually does, though? Because I know. feel like they fit what you're talking about, which is you put something out there, you see what how people use it. I mean, Steve Jobs said, no apps, we're never doing apps. Right. But they realized, they did, you they know did moderate that actually bit. works. And I think, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who want to be the next Steve Jobs. Right. I mean, I think it's going to be more than 100 companies. Yeah, it's going to okay. be, you know, 100,000. But everybody, when they say, I want to be the next Steve Jobs, what they have in mind is the Steve launching the iPad on the stage, world focused on him, president calling up, congratulate, like, they forget the Steve Jobs that I admire, the Steve Jobs who launched the Apple One. Right. Right. The Apple One did almost, that was a hobbyist app kit, you know, put your own computer together. There was no apps, there was no iPhone, no iPad. I mean, it's a very simple, classic MVP. It was used by, at most, I don't know, a few hundred, a few thousand what's, people. What's an MVP? Uh, the minimum viable product. The minimum viable product. So it wasn't, you know, you got to start with those small first steps before you get to be maybe 25 years later, the guy on the stage that everybody lost. Does it start, though, with an idea? I mean, does it start with the germ of it? Uh, there, there's mm -hmm. there, there's 5,000, 20,000, actually more like 50,000 people watching. Probably half of them would like to start a company. Uh -huh. I hope they do. So so give them some direction. They have an idea. Yeah. Is that the first pl place you start? A scratch your own itch kind of thing? Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to be... Well, one thing I like about this model of entrepreneurship compared to certain other ideas that are out there is that you don't have to build for yourself necessarily. It's okay to build for somebody else, but if you're going to do that, you have to get to know that other person really well. You have to really be able to articulate clearly who is this product for and what are they going to use it for and it why. It has to scratch somebody's itch. It has to scratch itch. somebody's itch. But here's the thing. Most startup ideas are terrible. And that's actually not a problem. Mm -hmm. If you look at the real stories, you go back and read the real stories of how entrepreneurs actually started, most of them started off with like pretty bad ideas. Yeah, very Twitter, few of Twitter's them. Twitter's ideas, nothing like what we right. got. Very yeah, few yeah, of them ended up doing what they said they were going to say. Yeah, I mean, I, people always talk about Facebook, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, the great visionary. Oh, right. People yeah. forget, right? Before there was Facebook, there was Face Mash, the thing that shows you <laughs> compare farm animals and cartoons or whatever that was. Yeah. Yeah. You, you wouldn't go back to Mark Zuckerberg's dorm room if you go back in time and say, Mark, listen, don't you launch that Face Mash. That's stupid. You got to have some vision, man. Let's spend the next six months two years let's do a strategic plan let's really think through no would have that's killed not what vision look like that would be the end of facebook right. so so the key is to take your bad idea just acknowledge there's probably something wrong with it but inside of every bad idea is actually the kernel of a good idea waiting to be born right so what we want to do is discover which parts of the idea are brilliant which ones are crazy and then we're going to chip away at the bad ones revealing only the good that remains. And you you don't just like you don't say uh, do a focus group to figure that Absolutely stuff out. Not. And that's that's what that's what everybody thinks about with Apple like oh they don't do focus groups they mm -hmm. don't listen to the audience but you do 
take the audience into account, right? Absolutely. And after you put it out, you watch because that's one of the signs of how your product is working. You got it exactly right. Imagine I was a physicist and I came in here and I was like, guys, I'm trying to do science, but I have this problem. Electrons don't know what they want. I can't do a focus group with the protons and electrons, so yeah, therefore right. I'm giving up and going, I'm mean, like, what's wrong? I'm going to tell the electrons yeah. what they and, are. Or like, yeah, I'm, you know, if you want to do alchemy, but like, I'll just tell them, listen, lead turn, turn into, into gold. gold. Right? Yeah, Boom. Exactly. Like, neither of those is science. Science is you have a vision. You have a specific idea about something you think might work, and then you systematically try it using controlled experiments to figure out which parts of my idea are correct and which ones aren't. And I don't know, somehow in our pop culture, science has become like, it has this connotation that it's routine or it's not creative or it's like, hello, science is one of humanity's most creative pursuits. And so making entrepreneurship more scientific, I think, will be a great thing. I've had people say that to me, like, you're treating this too scientifically. I'm like, no, yeah. that's a good thing. Yeah, what's wrong with that? And, that? and that's where you're, I, I think one of the keys here is keeping those features slow or, or, or low so that you can tell how much of an effect they have. It's, it's, it's classic controlling for the variables. You got there, exactly yeah. right. So we're, we're talking to Eric Reese. He is the author of The Lean Startup, which is very, it's the hot title in Silicon Valley <laughs> from a Crown Business out right now. I mean, on the back of the book, Mark Andreessen, Mitch Kapor, <laughs> Warren Bennis, you've got, I mean, you've got, and you won't even have a hashtag. Of course I have a hashtag. Pound lean well, startup. How can you not? <laughs> <laughs> we were talking before the show about the hashtagification of the world. That's so right. uh, we're going to take a break, come back, but I want you to continue this process of helping our audience get their idea, their germ to a product, the yeah. minimum viable product, and then iterate and fail and get better and maybe even make a success out of it. I sure hope so. Yeah. Uh, before we do that, though, I want to tell you a little bit about our barbecue. We're having yeah, a barbecue. Isn't barbecue. it going to be fun? You're going to come? Yeah, absolutely. It's your day off. It's not fun, come. though. And it's no, you got to come. And it's food. Barbecue food. By the way, really good food. I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if it's going to be like ribs barbecue. I don't know. What is the menu? Man? I don't care how we spell it. It's going to be good. <laughs> Aaron Jones. Yeah, we <laughs> misspelled it. You, do you agree with me? It's not yes. spelled with a Q? No. All right. Unless you spell it bar B -B -Q. dash B dash Q right. or something crazy. Well, you come from Texas. You should yeah. know that. It's by way of Missouri. But you should know this. Uh, Missouri has barbecue. Yeah, yeah they're great barbecue in oh, St. Louis. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. So anyway, the, the ad's for Ford, not barbecue. But it sounds like it's an ad for barbecue. Right. Because we know you love barbecue. Ford, however, <laughs> is the sponsor. <laughs> and so here's, here's what's going on. We're Come have, for the barbecue, stay for the Ford. Stay for the Ford. We're going to have Ford vehicles there. We're going to have great food. But we only have room for 50. So there's two of these, 50 each, November 14th. Is that right? Or is it the 13th? November 13th. November 13th, that's it. And December 4th. At 1.30 p.m., we'll be here. Uh, the hosts of our new gaming show, Brian uh, Brushwood of Veronica uh, Belmont, will be here. Uh, the Fords will be here. The food will be here. It'll be so much fun. You can look for your brick on the wall. But we have to get you to go to twit.tv to request tickets. And if this goes well, I think we're going to do this in other ways, in other venues around the country. So, uh, you know, come if you can. We'd love to have you. Again, uh, the 13th, a week from Sunday, and uh, December 4th. And what you'll be seeing is these amazing Ford vehicles. Ford has really done something unheard of. I mean, here's an old line company. It was a startup once, but that was more than 100 years ago. How do you reinvent yourself? How do you keep up with the times? And, you know, I think a lot of companies can't do that. And when a company does it like Ford, it's really kind of wow. And I give a lot of credit to their CEO, Alan Mulally, who came in, an engineer, a guy who was all about process, about innovation, about electronics. He's the guy who did the uh, 777 cockpit for Boeing. Just like a genius, came in and said, "We're going to we're going to invent it, reinvent this company from the ground up." First thing he did is said, "We got to get on a good financial footing." I see tough times ahead. They never took a bailout from the government because Ford was very proactive in being financially sound. Next thing he did is he said. We got to take these cars into the 21st century, and that's where you get Ford Sync, my Ford Touch, where you get these amazing engines that give you great fuel economy and yet perform like muscle cars. I love my Mustang. I mean, it's incredible. And yet, you know, I mean, I'm in the Mustang, and it's like Siri. Two years ago, I pressed the button on the, very important, keep your eyes on the road, hands on the wheel, 10 and 2, right? And I press the button, and it goes boom, and I say, Play the Rolling Stones. It's so cool. And now they've got this new app link, so your smartphone ties into the Ford Sync. And you could say, play my, my Rolling Stones station on Pandora. You could say, thumbs up or thumbs down to a song. You can literally press the button and say, thumbs down. You could say, bookmark this song so you can buy it later. Uh, they have Stitcher. They have a thing called OpenBeak. This is, this is just so cool. OpenBeak will read you your tweets. 
They do not let you tweet yet. No, you can't post. But you I can, think you that's can, appropriate. I don't want people driving down the road going, hashtag, get hashtag, out of my way. Get out of SUV. my way. Wait a minute. Did I, did I do something here? I can't hear. Am I okay? Oh, I must have sat on something. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so Apps. Open Beak, Open uh, Beak Stitcher, you so you can listen to us. Michael Zapruder rap. I don't know what the hell that I is. I like his film. That's interesting. So he's talking to his car. Okay, I just want you to understand that. He's talking to his car. Look, at, if you want to find out more, go to Ford.com slash technology or come to the barbecue. There are all these great technologies. My key. So if you've got teenagers, I love this. It says you can't go faster than this and you can't turn the set. Turn down that stereo. It will only let the stereo go up to a certain level in the car. I love that. Isn't that great? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. If it's too loud, I'm driving. It's too loud. Ford.com slash technology. Check out the apps, app link uh, on Ford Sync and the 2012 Ford Fiesta and other models. So we got, we got a German idea. We know it's crap. It doesn't have to be good. We don't have to focus group test it. We just have to know that there's somebody who wants it and know that person pretty well, right? Exactly if it's right. not us, somebody else. What's and the next step? So instead of trying to find the answers, we're trying to figure out what questions to ask. So we don't need to know... Look, we say we want to know the customer, but we're probably wrong about who that customer is going to yeah. be, right? So let's, we got we got to really be okay with that. The key is we have this concept we call build, measure, learn. It's a three-step feedback loop, very simple. I have an idea. I'm going to turn that idea into a product. I'm going to measure how people interact with that product to collect data. From that data, I'm going to impact my next set of ideas. And we're going to do everything we can to minimize the total time of that loop so we can go as fast as possible. That's the engine that really drives startups forward. How do you know what to measure? So... Well, it goes back to what's your hypothesis. Whatever you believe so scientific is method. To that scientific method. So uh, if I'm working on, my idea is teleportation. Okay? Uh, like, that's a pretty good, good idea. idea, right? Sure, so I love that. That's, that's a, that's, what's great about teleportation is it's pretty easy to test if people <laughs> want it. Okay? You don't have to really worry about that. But everyone thinks their idea is as good as teleportation. So I'm right. saying, even if you're working on teleportation, let's just double check. Yeah. Right? Double, all we're going to do is double check, check. That's right. And yep. you want to figure out, you know, the great thing about teleportation, since everybody should want it, it should be very easy to test. Well, I'm going to go offer 10 people the chance to pre-order my teleportation product. Theory says I should get 10 out of 10 people being like, yes, please, I cannot wait right. to get it. Okay, well, that's a, guess what? That's a prediction. That's a 100% conversion rate. Excellent. Let's go run the experiment. And the great thing about the Internet is no matter what business you're in, no matter what industry you're in, your customers are on the Internet, and these experiments can be run really cheaply. Right. Because you only need, in a lot of cases, a couple hundred people to come to your website and give them the chance to pre-order and see what happens. Dropbox is a perfect example. Exactly. They didn't have a product, but they made a video. Yeah, people See what up. happens. If nobody has signed up for that video, they wouldn't have meant give up and go home. But again, it would be the double check, something's not right. Right? Yeah. That product is so cool. That video is so cool. What are, what's people not working? People shouldn't want it. Something, yeah. Something's not quite right. And because most of the time, we wind up building something that nobody wants, that's the first thing you always want to just double check, make sure right. people actually basically want what you're doing. And if you pass that first test, then... You can kind of keep going. Well, what are the next set of assumptions that are in my business plan? I think the key point here, too, is that you're not going out and doing a survey. You're not no, asking no people, surveys, do you think no you want groups. this? Exactly right. Because people, people lie. lie. People don't have know no what. Idea. And, and that goes back to the Apple thing. People don't know what they want, but you give them the opportunity to show that they want exactly it. Exactly right. Yeah. To demonstrate their, through their behavior that you're right about them. That's, that's all we're saying. Because fundamentally, a business is designed to change people's behavior in a good way. Now, sometimes the behavior we want to change is they will take their credit card out of their wallet and right. give it to us. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a behavior. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's not about that. Right? Think about something like Facebook. That's about getting customers to engage with the product so that they will become this, like, give you all this attention, which you can then resell to advertisers. So, like, anytime you get a product for free, you're the product, right? That's, is is that's Facebook is. kind of a poster child for this? I mean, it does seem like they iterate a lot, right? I, I think they do do a lot of these things. Now, here's the thing. The temptation when you become a professional expert like this yeah. is to want to claim that every company you know, out there, this. Apple, right. Facebook. Yeah, right. So the truth is, look, this is new. And what we want to do is take the techniques that I think the best companies have done uh, kind of intuitively and make it more of a system so that it's more available to other people. Love but it. I do think that Facebook did a lot of things right, and especially... One of the stories I tell in the book is actually about Facebook. When they first came to California, if you've seen the movie, like that's, that is a kernel of truth that's true. They really did move to a house in Palo Alto. Sean Parker really, really did run into them on the street. That's all real. And when they were in that house, um, they were able to raise money. I think they raised like half a million dollars from Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel, yeah. They had a couple thousand users. Right. And they were on a handful of college campuses. Their big numbers, the, what we call the vanity metrics, 
were really pathetically small. Right. You think about that, how could they raise so much money with such small numbers? Because they weren't focused on the vanity metrics. They were focused on what we call the actionable metrics, the real data that says what's going on, like the per user behavior mm -hmm. of each person on Facebook. The thing about Facebook that was so remarkable was two things. One, customers found it very valuable. How did they know? Because more than half would come back every day. Right? Very clear indication that they found it valuable. And two, you need to know how the product is going to grow. Facebook had a very like very clear growth strategy, which was when they launch on a new campus, I think it's something like took them about two weeks on average to get 80% <laughs> penetration of the whole campus. It's amazing. Right? Yeah. Incredible value, incredible growth. From those two numbers, you know, they were able to raise money, but not just, and that's important not just because they could raise money, but that provided real concrete validation that you can't fake. Vanity metrics you could always fake with a Super Bowl ad or right. some other publicity sure, right. stunt. You can artificially time, you pump artificially them up. Pump yeah. it up. But, but the, the nature of vanity metrics is they're expensive. So you're saying create an inexpensive, small-scale exactly right. test that will give you valid measurements of your you got it. hypotheses. And then it's very scientific test, method. We just make the test bigger and bigger and bigger yeah. uh, as we get to more, you know, if we get to succeeding stages. Do you explicitly ri suggest writing out your hypotheses, what you're going to test? I mean, I guess you, the more explicit you are about this, I think so. the I mean, clearer. The, there are a lot of frameworks out there that people use to try and identify what are the key assumptions, and I, I'm agnostic as to which framework you use. You know, you can, if you went to business school, you were going to want to use the Michael Porter Five Forces Competitive Strategy. That's fine. You want to use business model generation. That's fine. There's all these different frameworks. The key thing is put yourself in a position to be wrong. Because I have never once in my whole career, I've worked with thousands of entrepreneurs now, I've never been able to convince even one entrepreneur that their idea was wrong through argument. Right. It never works. Even no. if I'm right and their, their idea is really terrible no. and it, it violates every principle of sound strategy, it doesn't work. No, because I think we believe we success believe. depends on belief, right? And it does. I have to really you believe have to this. Really believe. And, and the reason so. entrepreneurship is hard is you have to be able to hold two ideas in your head at the same time. One, I completely believe my idea is absolutely going to change the world. It's the most important thing in the entire universe. And also, my idea is probably fatally flawed and won't work at all. <laughs> and how can you hold those two ideas at the same time? That creates cognitive dissonance. It right. literally gives you a headache. Right. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, all you have to do is be willing to put up with the headache. Yeah. I mean, it really is that simple. Yeah. But then, okay, I got the headache, now what? So that being an entrepreneur is, is a headache is literally true. Oh, oh it, yeah. is, it is. Listen, <laughs> it is physically painful. I can attest to Here's that to the time. crazy ones, the yeah. headachey folks. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. You yeah. kind of have to be crazy to do it. So, so we're, when you're thinking of those two different possibilities and you're holding them in your mind, are you thinking of them that extreme or is it, is it more of a like, you know, a feeding back and forth between the two? The truth is, emotionally, it tends to be the roller coaster. Yeah. You guys know, it's like one day you're convinced it's going to work, you finally made it, and the next day it's just, it's, it's doom and gloom. And actually what we want to do, this, we want to create a context for entrepreneurs that's just more supportive. So that, not that you're not going to go through those highs and lows, but that we can help keep the whole company focused on the long-term vision of where you're trying to go and waste less time debating and arguing and reading the tea leaves. Because when we have, we, we work out in the book, I try to advocate for a system of quantitative assessment mm -hmm. to demonstrate that you're making progress and you, prove it. Then you don't have to worry, am I making progress? Because we, we get the quantitative validation, we really are making you progress. You talk about Nick Swinburne who founded Zappos. Yeah. It, nobody believed that, <laughs> he didn't know. It, would somebody buy shoes on... Uh, online? Yeah. That doesn't, I mean, maybe they want to try them on. I don't know. So what did he do? He goes to shoe stores, takes pictures of shoes, says, look, if I can sell this online, I'll pay you full price. Would you let me take a picture of the shoe? Yeah. And he it, basically, it's a made-up site where he puts pictures of shoes and validates his thesis. Exactly right. And you think about how much better that is than a focus group or market research. Because you're not, you're not asking people any questions. You're offering them. You're selling them a product. But you're also not doing anything hypothetical. This is not Kitchen right. of the Future you know, concept video. This is a real product, real customers. And the great thing about it is not only can you test your assumptions that you thought you had, you can discover assumptions that you didn't even know you were making. Well, this is what you say. It has to allow you to be surprised when customers behave in unexpected ways. For instance, and you might not have thought about this, what if they return them? I know. Now what? Yeah. So you have to have the space to allow these unexpected results in your, in your experiment. Exactly. And then, and then listen and, and, be, right. and act upon it. Right? And, then, and that's where the, the art and the judgment and the human part of entrepreneurship comes in. Because what you, you run these experiments and then you have to interpret the results. And you have to decide, uh, we call it pivot or persevere. Mm -hmm. right? Am I on the right track <laughs> right. or 
not. And and if not, you know, where do I go next? And there's no shame to pivoting. There's no shame to pivoting. In, in fact, fact, it's a shame not to pivot if you have a crappy idea. Yeah, I mean, if you're banging your head against the right. wall, you know, is it is the, is the better part of valor is to go put your head somewhere else right. instead of waiting until it's a bloody pulp. I think a lot of people, they, they get this like, okay, I'm going to observe, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to look for data points that, that don't have bias in them mm -hmm. uh, so that I can bring that in. But when you find those law of unintended consequences. I don't know how many times I've had people in these sort of situations go, well, but why do they want to do that? Yeah. Or let's not let them do that. Let's, yeah. put, let's yeah. push oh, the sure. audience around and make them do this. How do you get over that resistance, that natural hump, and say, no, we, have to, we just have to reimagine and include this objectively. Mm -hmm. it's, it, don't make it personal. It's like, that's just the way they're going to act, and you can't <laughs> change them. So how do, we how do you get to that point well, where you can incorporate it? One thing is, actually, if someone wants to change human behavior, hum it, someone's, oftentimes these can come down to, my plan is to change human nature, and then. That yeah. seems like a bad plan, it's but not, okay, go but for you it. Know what? That's the great thing about the double check. As an entrepreneur, everyone's always telling you your idea is bad. You don't right. want to listen. This gives you an alternative. Listen, we don't have to debate it. Let's go Let's find out. Happens. Let's try to change the behavior. And right. sometimes the answer is you can, and sometimes mm -hmm. the answer is you can't. And it doesn't matter in an abstract way who's right and who's wrong. It only matters, do I have the ability to do that? Can my company actually do that? So uh, when we move beyond just being a single founder with an idea, well, we're actually trying to build an organization. That's why I say in the book, entrepreneurship that's, is management. That's right? a hard is, part. This is hard. If the first step, everybody at home can say, oh, I get that. Uh, but design an experiment and test it and see if yeah. it works. How hard could that be? Now you got to build a company. That's really hard, yeah. right? Yeah, and there yeah, are, right. and they, unfortunately, there are, I guess there's well-known rules for how to do it. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. It's One of the things I, I was really surprised about in, in writing the book was how much of our modern management theory that, that teaches people how to build organizations yeah. is, was designed for a very specific context. Basically, mm -hmm. 1920s Mad to men. 1960s America. <laughs> yes. Which, you know, was a very dynamic time, so they thought at the time, but compared to today, it was a very Nothing. stable yeah. business environment. Yeah. And so most management tools are based on, fundamentally, planning and forecasting. Sure. It's the organization, man. It's the Peter Principle. It's exactly all right. of this stuff. Drucker. All that Drucker. Drucker. Yeah. yeah. And listen, and that stuff is great. And w listen, look around. Every object you see in this room was manufactured right. using those principles. So I'm nothing wrong with that. But right. think about it. Planning and forecasting require a long and stable operating history from which to extrapolate We the ain't forecast. got that. Yeah. If you don't have that, right. then forecasting is not a tool that's available to you. Well, who feels like the world is getting more and more stable every day? <laughs> yeah. Like, of course not. So those tools are becoming less and less relevant. And what I argue for in the book is that we need to develop a new toolkit, what I call entrepreneurial management, which is about how do you build an organization when you face these really uncertain times that we live in, or the fundamental uncertainty of building a new product that's fundamentally new. Tell me, I need it. How? How? <laughs> how, Eric? How? I Tell got me. Your attention. I love it. <laughs> the best part about doing interviews with an actual entrepreneur instead of just a talking head is like, okay. you get into this stuff. It's like, wait, uh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. I, you know, I had, I had somebody else. I actually got him to pivot their business while we were on the show. So No kidding. Yeah, so, you know, we'll, let's see what we can I'm do. I'm sure Jim Latterbeck was very grateful to you for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no comment. Just no kidding. Comment to make it just that. kidding. So, so um, that's, so the, and by the way, we, we, at, at, you have not yet said anything about raising money. That's right. Um, why not? It's actually not a very interesting topic. I mean, it's complicated. It has its own set of complexities. And sometimes people think lean means don't raise money or raise right. money. But really, lean is about taking whatever resources you have available to you and using them more efficiently. So it, it's, it's an orthogonal question whether you raise a lot of money or a little bit of money. It's, it's not really directly relevant. And entrepreneurs often get sucked into, I mean, read entrepreneurship topics online. That's all it's they like, talk about. Everything's all about money. money. It's like, how do I convince this right. gatekeeper or that gatekeeper? Well, it's and the it, oxygen that fuels the fire, right? Yeah. And, but it and isn't, it really. Doesn't, it doesn't have to be. And I think that the problem with the way we're doing fundraising today in general and the whole ecosystem is basically based on pattern recognition, right? right? I'm looking for the next Mark Zuckerberg, the next Mark right. But like, pattern recognition is just a fancy word for bias. Right. So, and if you understand the patterns that are being recognized as an entrepreneur, you can game the system. It's easy to get money. By trying to make yourself A lot harder to make a good like, startup. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. So I think every ounce of energy I put into it, that people put into what I call success theater, they're putting on this show, putting right. on the black turtleneck, trying to be, right. like that's energy that could have been spent building a great company and that. serving customers. I love and that. And so I think our attention, we get way distracted by the shiny object. And if you look, I mean, again, I always go back to Mark Zuckerberg because when he came to Palo Alto, he was not some polished fundraising guy. I mean, 
He didn't know, you know, he didn't know how to raise money. He didn't, but he had the data, the numbers. He had the value metrics and the growth metrics. Exactly he knew right. he could demonstrate this is something amazing. Yeah. And because of that, not only could he raise money, he had the leverage to insist on really cool terms. Right. So all the ninja stuff you read about online about how to create a great term sheet, all that stuff doesn't matter if you don't have the leverage to do it. And you get leverage two ways. You can either be, have great social proof and be, you know, have a great background and be a certain, or you can have the data that shows that you're actually making something that matters. And Boy, I would much rather have the latter than the former. So really, this is the data-driven startup in, yeah. in many ways. It's, Absolutely. Yeah. Be driven by data. Yeah. It, I mean, I just I, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go along with that, but I'm just gonna just repeat one thing, which is that sometimes people hear data-driven and they think that means no vision. And if you're just doing experiments, if you use the word experiment to you me, need a hypothesis before exactly. you can do an experiment. Right. First, Albert Einstein, Richard Feynman, <laughs> all these these huge scientists, they all had vision. That led them to say, "Well, let exactly me let right. me see if this works. Let me test I mean, this. I let me part, explore part one this." One of the book is called Vision. I mean, that really yeah. is the first. That yeah. is the foundation upon which all entrepreneurship is built. But then it's like vision. Then what? Right? You can't just will the world to be the way you want it to be, despite right. all the stuff you read about that. That is not true. Um, you can convince other people about that, but that is not true. You have to actually make sure that that the elements of your vision um, that require specific things to be true are in fact true. And, and when we go and get into more detail, we really try to differentiate your vision, which is where you're trying to go, the change you want to see in the world, is separate from the strategy by which you will achieve that vision, separate from the product that you sell to customers. That's right? a very product, good point. Product, strategy, Because I think a lot of people think, well, my vision is the, is the end product. It's the whole thing. Right. And it, uh, and it isn't. When, the, when, the, when push comes to shove, most entrepreneurs will realize, oh, I can let this go because I really wanted to do this other thing. So, you know, you look at... And when Groupon made the pivot from the point, the petition site, to social coupons, you know, in retrospect, it kind of, you can kind of see the connection. You'd be like, oh, they were interested in this kind of group empowerment, collective mm -hmm. action. But like, on the That's face a pretty of it, big pivot. It's a pretty big pivot. <laughs> it's equivalent to the Flickr people going from a game, game. A gaming to a photo sharing site. Yeah, or the Odeo guys becoming right, Twitter. Right. From the outside, it often seems like there's nothing going on. But if you're there in the moment, you, you will always find there's a certain continuity of vision between the products. And I, I like Groupon especially because, you know, you know what their first Groupon was. Mm -mm. Okay, the very first Groupon was actually two for one pizza, in the pizza restaurant in the lobby of their building. <laughs> uh, when I was in Chicago on a book tour. I got to eat at that. Pizza they tested restaurant. it. It's still there. They yeah. tested it. Okay, twenty people redeemed the coupon. Yeah. They, there was no comp, there was no technology. There was a, web, a WordPress blog that they reskinned to say Groupon, <laughs> and they were literally on their laptops emailing all the coupons, PDFs that they made on the laptop. That was it wow. to those people. And now, I understand you guys, if you had been there, you would have been like, oh, two for 20 free pizzas? That's a billion dollar business. Right. So obvious. So, yeah. right? I, I wasn't, Eat. I thought, you know, right. Exactly. Who wouldn't have thought of Who that? Who would have thought of that? Yeah. Right. But the reason they were able to understand how powerful that was is because they had spent a year trying to get that, trying kind to get of that other thing to work. Is right? this virality we're talking about? Is that key to this? It's one of the three, what I call engines of growth. People think that if you have a great product, it just grows itself, you know, through word of mouth. And that really isn't true. Growth is something that has to be engineered, especially if you want hyper growth, the kind of growth that powers group on and Facebook and right. Google and these kind of companies. And um, I want us to be focused as entrepreneurs on sustainable growth. And sustainable growth means that new customers come from the actions of past customers. Oh, I like that. Right? Either through direct viral engagement, so yeah. your PayPal, Facebook, or because the past customers are coming back themselves and becoming your new customers through some kind of repeat retention-based business, your World of Warcraft, your cell phone mm -hmm. company, right? your subscription-based businesses, or the revenue that the past customers generated, you can invest into advertising. So that's what we call the paid engine of growth. So the three engines of growth, viral, sticky, paid. And each of those engines, it works like a feedback loop. And the faster the loop turns, the faster your growth will be. And it allows you to identify the key critical few metrics that really matter for your business. So if you're trying to build a new world of Warcraft, what matters is the engagement rate. How addictive is the product? You know, how many people come back? It, it doesn't matter how easy it is to get into the product. If you've ever tried to install World of Warcraft, it takes like four hours mm -hmm. and 92 CDs. It's Every like, time it's I like, play it, I have to, to do a hundred updates. Yeah, hundred patches. Like, and all that's, that. yeah. It's, it's like, but you like, haven't played I thought we would do That's right. <laughs> Listen, I can't play again because it's a problem. Yeah, it that's a problem. a problem. Yeah, exactly. But I'm going to start playing right now. Right? People, <laughs> people will go all the way through that. Addictive is a very good marketing strategy, by the way. Exactly right. Yeah. Whereas, let's say you're building a dating site. That's sticky. That's what you would call sticky. You're building a dating site. If you have a dating site with high retention, 
something seriously wrong. Yeah, people are, right? people are not getting... customers don't want to be on the dating site. Right. They want to get off right. the dating right. site. Right. Right. So right. it really you have to really understand what is Depends my on your theory of growth. But yeah, most of the time, right? Listen, the kind of dating <laughs> sites what we're talking about for. today. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah for, for details. Yeah. So it's about really understanding why are people in your product, how is it going to create value for them, and then how is that value going to turn into growth? And that can help you answer questions. Like people are always like, you should charge money for your product from day one. It's like, really? Because what if Facebook had followed that advice? Right. It would been yeah. a disaster. So no, not necessarily. Only in certain uh, engines of growth is how much you charge customers a key leap of faith assumption. In others, it kind of doesn't matter. Sounds like being an entrepreneur really is a lot. There's a lot of thinking involved. Yeah. There's a lot of taking some time and thinking about your stuff. A lot of it, it sounds like a very cerebral act, oddly enough. It's, it's tricky. It, when you slow it down in order to really analyze the components like we're doing now, it sounds cerebral and calm and very rational. <laughs> but you know, when you're in the heat of the moment, it because- When you're driving the train. Oh, it's so fast that things yeah. are going crazy. So that what's happening is, the reason I think it's important to slow it down and really get this theory right is so that people can get better at it. So that when they're in the moment, they don't have to be like thinking about it's it for the first time. They yeah. can develop those instincts and judgment. Yeah. And the lesson, yeah. the number one lesson of the scientific method is that although we rely on judgment as human beings, we can train our judgment to get better over time by making testable predictions. Because when you get, when you fail, you can learn. Right. And the converse of that is that if you can't fail, you can't learn. Right. So people who have the idea that I'm gonna just ship it and see what happens, never learn. Why? Because you're guaranteed to succeed at seeing what happens. <laughs> right? Something's gonna happen yeah, for right. sure, but then what? So you, ahead of time, wanna you say- You wanna make a prediction of what's yeah. supposed to happen so that you can be wrong. You can have you know what they call a falsifiable hypothesis in the fancy language of-, of It's kinda science. like a safety net. You're putting bumpers on your perception so mm -hmm. that you don't mm -hmm. bias your results by saying, well, th that's exactly what I thought would happen. <laughs> right. No, you gotta say that ahead of time. Exactly. Anyone who's ever used Google Analytics knows Eric's law of Google Analytics, which is no matter how badly you are screwing up at any time, there is always at least one graph- in One Analytics metric that looks that's great. That's up into the right. <laughs> yeah. So you just pull that one out of your deck. Look you how that good we're doing. Look, we're up into the right on this thing I never heard of before, you know. You know, I wanna ask you uh, what you were saying about growth, the yeah. sustainable growth, particularly, uh, I, I feel like that goes back to the financial aspect where people are so focused on the money because they feel like, well, I have to grow and I have to grow yeah. fast, so I need money for that, which then leads them to having a bunch of people who say, show me how you're growing so that I can see my investment. <laughs> totally how, how do you get off that treadmill and be able to focus on sustainable yeah. growth? It goes right to the heart of the question, why do you become an entrepreneur? Because if your goal in building a, a startup is to make money, you got serious problems. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's not a very good way to make money. Okay, go work at Goldman Sachs, for God's sake. Yeah, you want to make, yeah, there are way better yeah. ways to make money. Where easier ways, I should say, sure. easier ways to make money. But also, a company that exists to make money, the so-called shareholder value theory of the company, can never make any decisions. Because how do you know, you know, if you're I'm- You're chasing like, your tail yeah, every it's moment. Like a or B, and pretty much, if you're just like split testing and experimenting, just like, all I want to do is make more money, within five minutes, you'll be selling porn. Right. right, like you just you're, you know, you're right. if you're honest. About if you really it, yeah. want to optimize, optimize for porn. That's right. a guarantee. Like, that's what you're trying to do. Yeah. And, and you and you I feel that. Pressure. That's it's. <laughs> you heard of Godwin's law. That's we got Reese's law here. It all comes <laughs> down to that. Down to yep. So no, you're right though. Help Absolutely. People get out of that trap, and right. that's why. So what should you want? Well, so this is now where it gets a little bit complicated. In the book, I spent a lot of time in the book talking about the need for an accounting revolution. Hmm. It's like accounting. Is there anything more boring in the right. whole world? We're going to take back. a break right yeah, exactly. now, and uh, we'll I'm get sorry. back to accounting. No, go ahead. Accounting. Go ahead. Go ahead. But, but the truth is, a lot of our problems stem from the way we account for progress in startups. Mm, right. And in order to get off that treadmill, we really have to get serious about what what is progress. If it's not the vanity metrics, if it's not right. just profitability and ROI, well, what the what the hell what is, is it? it? What is it? So, uh, what we want to do, we identify those actionable non-vanity metrics that are related to our engine of growth, like take their viral coefficient, right? right? How fast is my viral loop turning over? I right? said, so that's the key number. Now, uh, product market fit for a viral business is a viral coefficient greater than 1.0, right? You know, that's when an epidemic goes super linear, is when for each person that comes in, more than one of their friends comes with them, right. and then more one of them, and then you go right. crazy. So when you're trying to build a viral business, the first time you run the experiment, you're going to have a viral coefficient. It's not going to be 1.0. No. It's going to be like 0.1. Right. And you're going to be depressed. Right. That's not going to work. A viral coefficient of 0.1 means you're not going to grow. You're going to shrink. People at that point get tempted to like want to throw money at the problem and do press and launch and hope to jump. But that actually doesn't help the fundamental aspect of the product, which is how viral is the product itself. Mm -hmm. So each cohort of customers that come into our product, maybe each week or each month, we want to measure 
what are those key numbers? Those are key conversion rates, those key viral coefficient. And sometimes the numbers will go like this. Like let's say you want it to be 1.0 and it starts at 0.1. Sometimes it'll be like in one month it'll be 0.1, then 0.3, then 0.7, and you're like, right? It's not a feel, we're getting, we're getting that, we're making progress. And you're not at 1.0 yet, you're not done, but you can really say, you know, we're, we're gonna make it this year. And then sometimes it goes like this. It's like 0.1 and you jump up to 0.5 and it's great. And it's like 0.5, 0.55, 0.75, 0.575, 75, you know. And I meet teams that are, that are tra trapped in the land of the living dead mm -hmm. because even though they're hitting an obvious point of diminishing returns, it's still up and to the right. Yeah. So they still feel like they should keep going. And again, it goes back to that. Habit. So when do you decide to pivot? What is it, what is it that you need to... There's no hard and fast rule, but I think the number one indicator is that feeling of diminishing returns. Right. Like most of it's us are still growing. It's still growing. It's still up to the right. right? When you can see the, the growth of the growth isn't enough. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. So it's it's the engine is still turning. I mean, a lot of companies when I ask them, "Are you making progress?" They're like, "Well, sure, I am." I'm like, "Well, how do you know?" Well, la we made these awesome features last month, and this month our numbers are higher than last month. Right. Therefore, QED. You know, it's and I'm like, interesting. If you guys all took a month off and just company-wide month-long vacation except for the sales and customer service team all product development month off would your numbers be up into the right <laughs> and they're like yeah well, sure of course because like you know we're word of yeah. mouth it's still going it just happens it. Yeah. right yeah. it happens and we got great seo and all this yeah. so it's like okay so you're telling me that if you took a vacation you'd make it just as much progress as you and they're like well but but, but. And it's like hold on yeah i got a, i have another author. i have a better theory my theory is that uh, Mercury was in retrograde last month, <laughs> and I heard through astrology that when Mercury is in retrograde, all numbers go up. That's my and people, especially engineers, right? Science, no, they get mad at me. Oh, you, can't do that. You're crazy. I don't yeah. believe in astrology. I'm like, well, listen, I'm just visiting, but you live here. Yeah. And which of us? Has neither of us knows whether yeah. you're not, like we don't right. know what cause and effect. So we want we got to get out of that kind of throwing darts at a dartboard, or like this kind of voodoo <laughs> momentum theory of what right. causes. No, we want to really get down to true cause and effect. And when you do that, when you really look at it that way, the problem with the diminishing returns becomes painfully obvious. Yeah. Because you're still working hard. You're doing just as much work to get a crappy experiment as a successful experiment. Because productivity in a startup is not about how much stuff you make. It's not about how much energy you invest, right? It's how well what you're doing matches with what customers can accept, right? It's, it's the results you get. But why does it have to grow at an exponential rate? I mean, you could just match what customers want, and there we go. We've, we've, we're done. Mm. I think that that's true. I mean, if you if you don't do anything, if you just leave the product, if you have a good product and it just basically works, yeah. you will get linear growth right. just through word of mouth. It'll right. Happen for you. And if that's all you want, like you're building a lifestyle business and you got you found your niche and you, that's great. But then let's just admit that's what's going on and let's stop tinkering with the product. Right. If we don't, if it works and we're satisfied, right. that's great. But what happens is, we're human beings. We can never resist tinkering. Right. And yet, most teams that I meet do not know if they are busy making their product better or worse. Right. Would a little calculus help them? <laughs> Look at acceleration, not velocity. I'd just like yeah. to announce that we are going to pivot to a bicycle store on tomorrow. <laughs> the book is The Lean Startup. Eric Rees is the author. We'll have more with Eric in just a bit. Uh, let's talk about a business that could probably use some help from you, Eric, right uh -oh. now. Netflix. Uh, Netflix is our sponsor, <laughs> so don't be mean. No, but I think, you know, this is the other problem. We'll talk about it. It's not always in your hands. There are other forces besides you and your customers, and Netflix is an example where they are in an, in an interesting position, and I think they're making a pivot. I don't think people understand, but this is a pivot. They're going to streaming, and instead of, they were the DVD email company, but they have an amazing streaming business, and by creating content, buying content, they are finding a way to, I think, survive in, an, in a hostile environment. Well, they weren't always a DVD my mail company. They've pivoted before. What were they before? I, I'm trying to remember what they were, but when they first started, it wasn't DVD they, by mail. It they, wasn't they, rental DVD. They sold DVDs. They That's sold it. That was it. They just That's sold right. them over the internet. Oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Well, here's the deal. Go to Netflix.com slash twit, and for $7.99 a month, you can watch like all this great stuff, like Mad Men, these documentaries, these classic movies, these brand new movies. It's an amazing... I was watching a Nicolas Cage movie that came out this year, The Season of the Witch. You ever see that? Oh, no. Good for Halloween. Really? I scared that crap out of me. Anyway, you never know what you're going to find on Netflix. Looks great. Plays on all the devices. In fact, I just set up the Google TV again, and it looks great on that. Yeah, that was the movie. I'm not saying it was a great movie, but here's the beauty. Here's the beauty part. It didn't cost me anything to watch it. <laughs> $7.99 a month, and I'll tell you, I'll make it even a better deal for you. Your first month's free if you go to Netflix.com slash twit.
Netflix.com slash Twit. You're going to love it. It is really a great deal in entertainment. But it is an interesting point. You don't always have control of market forces, right? Sometimes, as in Netflix case, your suppliers, the movie companies, mm -hmm. decide they want to put you out of business. Yep. <laughs> what do you do then? Huh? That, and that's the thing. That's why the concept of pivot is so important. I mean, it's kind of an overused buzzword. I mean, really, I'm sorry, but it's just how it is. Um, a pivot is not necessarily mean. First of all, it's not necessarily a bad thing. But it that's, by the way, made a mistake. kind of one of the reasons that we are in an amazing entrepreneurial environment is not only is it inexpensive to be an entrepreneur, but failure is not anymore a stigma. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's understood so that that's part of that. it. In Europe, you go to Europe, failure is not good. You have failures on your resumes, it's bad. But here, it, we understand that's part of the deal. Fail faster. Yeah. yeah, fail faster. Interesting. If you look at the academic research, there's a bunch of academics that they're trying to study entrepreneurship. And the research isn't so great, but it's a few things they've studied well. And one of them, they've been trying to test this claim about failure. And the academics are frustrated because they're like, you know, statistically speaking, entrepreneurs who've failed are not any more likely to be successful than ones that haven't failed before. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, it's not the failure that makes them successful. Right? Yeah. It's the, what you learn, learn from right. the failure. And if you're stubborn and you just do the same thing over and over again and you do five failed businesses in a row, it's the same That's business. That's me. I just keep uh, doing this. Right. I keep One of these days it'll work. <laughs> I'm just going to keep doing it. Yeah, what it about the innovator's around. dilemma? Do you, I yes. mean, this is a classic. Uh, do you deal with that uh, mm -hmm. issue? It is. It is. Because one of the most controversial things I've been saying is that entrepreneurship is not about being in a small company. I have a definition of a startup. My definition. You could be an entrepreneur in any business. It's, like, right. it's a human institution designed to create something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty. That's all it is. Love it. So a lot of people thought they were getting a safe job in a safe company <laughs> in a safe industry. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they discovered, guess what? There's no such thing right. anymore. Yeah. And I call them involuntary entrepreneurs. Right. They didn't sign up to be an entrepreneur, but guess what? You're now tasked with dealing with this innovator. I think I've been, t I've been telling the high school my kids are in, you got to teach entrepreneurship. Because no matter what these kids do when they graduate, they are going to fa be facing an environment where exactly that. They have to continually invent It's got to be part of the foundation of this yeah. new social contract as a society that we are busy negotiating right I now. Agree. Because the institutions that supported us for the past century, Can't count on them. You know, they, they're not well adapted to the current environment, which is too chaotic, requires a lot more individual initiative. Right. But the great part is, it's also going to be a lot more creative right. because routine work is going to go away. Right. Anything that can be automated will be automated. So if something can be done by robots, it's going to be done by robots. And there's no earthly reason human beings should be doing something boring. The asset, the, the advantage we have, so many people on this earth, they have so much creativity and talent and, and ingenuity to give. What we have to do is create systems and structures that harness that ingenuity and creativity for a better purpose. Certainly no one watching this network should be... Uh, you know, flipping burgers. They all have that opportunity because, and, you know, everybody who's watching this network cares enough about this stuff. They care. They're watching. They're involved. They know a lot more than they think. Th they are yeah. natural entrepreneurs. So that's the thing is how do we get to that? It's yeah. not even just teaching entrepreneurial thinking. It, it, what I love about your approach is it's teaching critical thinking. Yeah. Yeah, it's scientific. I that's what's I love really it. important. I love yeah. the scientific so, I mean, method. I would issue this yeah. challenge to everybody watching right now, which is I know every single one of your viewers has an entrepreneurial idea in the back of their mind. I know it. They're like, I could have thought of that. Yep. Whatever it is, all like the assignment is test the idea tomorrow. Love it. 24 hour challenge. Okay, that's it. Don't spend a month, a week, a year, one day challenge. That's so great. And you don't have to, it doesn't have to be the greatest, fullest thing, but any idea, you can get the first validation in 24 hours. That's an eternity on the internet today. Absolutely. And I think anyone has to spend more than 100 bucks on their experiment, like, you know, it's, tr it's doing too much. So right. a minimum viable product, $100 budget max, 24 <laughs> hours, make it happen. Love it. And, and then read the book. The uh, lead. Honestly, you know, you <laughs> you, save $24. You'd be hours. crazy not <laughs> not to read the book first. Eric <laughs> Reyes. Awesome. And it is called The uh, Lean Thanks Startup. The plug, oh, Eric, really f great stuff. I wish I could keep you around uh, for another couple of weeks, maybe years. <laughs> and uh, you could show us everything we're doing wrong here, because I know we are. But that's... Maybe for another time. Do you do you work? You work with, with the Harvard folks. Do you work with any startup schools or uh, uh, incubators or anybody like that? I've, I've done some stuff with TechStars, uh -huh. and, and I've obviously spoken a lot of the incubators. But right. I, I try. Is to that a good I, method? You think? I mean, this is really what's going yeah. on now. Is and I, and I guess it, it, it all started with a uh, Paul Graham. Yeah. And Y Combinator, but uh, this is really kind of neat. It, you can learn this it's stuff. It's incredible. And and Paul deserves tremendous credit for pioneering Y Combinator, and in particular for encouraging people who wouldn't have otherwise become entrepreneurs to take the plunge, right? Yeah. Creating a credentialed, right. prestigious thing that you could do as an alternative to graduate school if you're a smart right. person who graduated from uh, a top school. 
And that has pulled a huge wave of talent into the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And the fact that all these guys have copied him has just created all these more op right. entrepreneurial opportunities for people. So I do think that, you know, I think that's really, uh, really an awesome. To thing. me, this is the thing that makes me the most optimistic. I'm basically a pessimist. I think the world's going to hell in a hand. That's <laughs> it. But we are in, a, in a, the most innovative time ever and the most opportunity for anybody to do this ever. And it's so exciting to see the ferment, the foment, yeah. the things that are happening, the bubbling stew of innovation. And it's great. It's amazing. And it's happening in this country primarily. And I think, you know, we're going to the web in December uh -huh. to talk to European entrepreneurs who are saying, how do we do this here? This everybody realizes this is the future for the planet Earth. Yeah. It's time to get serious about yeah, it. Yeah, we need you know, it. Because if we're just, we have the tools, the technology has made possible this democratization. So we're yep. going to have... Uh, orders of magnitude more startups active than yep. at any previous time in history. Absolutely. But if we use the same old outdated models for running those startups, we're not going to improve the success rate at all. We're just going to wind up with a ton more failure. Right. Yeah. And I think that would be a criminally negligent waste of people's time and energy. So I think we could do better. Eric Reese, the Lean Startup. Thank you, Eric. Pleasure to be Great here. to meet you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and thanks. thank you all for watching. I know every time we do triangulation, I say this. That was really great. I'm learning so much. It's so much fun. Tom Merritt, thank you for helping me uh, make this show work. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. We do triangulation whenever we can find somebody of Eric's stature, which is most Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC at twit.tv. You don't have to watch live. It's nice if you do because we pay attention to the chat room. But you can always watch the shows. We make audio and video uh, recordings available for download on our site and of course everywhere podcasts are like iTunes and the Zoom marketplace and uh, and all that. Who's next week? Do we know? Bree Pettis. Bree Pettis. Hey. Oh, I'm MakerBot. Sorry. All right. I'm That's going to be a lot. He's going to make that fun. manufacturing system even easier. Oh yeah, <laughs> talk about renting yeah. units of production. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Thank awesome. you, Eric. Cool. Thanks you, Tom. Thank you everybody. We'll see you next time on Triangulation.